Hello again. I was asked a couple of questions about the process uh, that people go through when there's a disaster and an evacuation. It usually doesn't go from zero to get out. It usually goes from zero to warning to mandatory evacuation. And uh, if, if you're smart or wise, perhaps I should say, you're prepared to evacuate if you live in an area where there's something like wildfires, earthquakes, tornadoes, flooding, hurricanes. You're prepared if you're wise. You're ready to evacuate should you need to. Um, it's very stressful for people who are not prepared. It's very stressful uh, because they run around like chickens without heads to gather what they think they might need and they can't think straight because, you know, some people, they can actually see the fire on the next ridge and so they're not happy campers. Um, so once you are under a mandatory evacuation order, once that's the case, then you have, I guess, three options. Either you know family or friends who have space who will take you in and house you until you're able to repopulate your home. Um, if you don't have family and friends, but you got money and you're able to find a hotel, uh, you can stay there till your money runs out or until you repopulate your home. Whichever happens first. If you don't have money, you don't have family or friends, then you seek shelter at an evacuation center, usually run by the Red Cross. Occasionally they're run by the county, but usually the Red Cross. And you go and you check in. And yes, the place I've been at, Green Valley Community Church, that is an evacuation center. They have a huge property. If you look them up on Google Maps, and then zoom in a little so you can, and put on the satellite layer, you can see their buildings and you can see their parking lots and the roads or driveways that are all around their property. And you can see just how huge it is. Um, they ask us not to film people. So I haven't, you know, taken a video on the property for that reason, um, but it's huge. And the parking lot, which is gigantic. Uh, and then on the other side of all the buildings, which is just like a field, if you will, uh, were filled with people with campers or RVs or pickup trucks. And then they happen to have tents and they set up their tents. Or they happen to have pop-ups and they set up a pop-up, a pop-up and hang tarps all around so they sort of have a private room, but they're outside. Uh, if you have pets, you have to stay outside. You can't bring pets into an evacuation center. And so besides all the people outside, there are also people inside sleeping on cots that the Red Cross sets up. And because we're in a COVID environment, fewer people can be in each room um, because there's you know, mandated six feet apart from the cot next to you, unless it's your family and you can sleep right next to them if you want to, but you have to be six feet away from other people. And, um, you stay there until the evacuation orders are lifted. Now what happened in where I'm at, at the shelter I'm at, some of the mandatory evacuation orders were downgraded to uh, evacuation warning. And what that means is that those people could go back home because the fire did not come to that neighborhood, but they, they have to stay packed because if the wind shifts and the fire comes back, they're gonna have to evacuate again. Uh, there were many homes destroyed in a neighborhood called Grizzly Flats. One of the links I sent the other day is the El Dorado County 
structure damage map. And when you look at that map, houses or structures, I should say, they're not necessarily all houses. They could be the shed in the backyard. Structures that were completely destroyed look like a little red monopoly house and structures that were affected are like a little green one and structures that have no damage and no impact are black little houses on the map. So uh, to get a better sense of how much was is gone now from this fire, uh, it's best you look at that map because I don't know a count, uh, but it's devastating for any whose home was destroyed. Everything's gone. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think 2015, I deployed with Samaritan's Purse to post fire to in the recovery uh, stage and helped. I had to wear a hazmat suit because uh, the environment, if there's been a fire in your home, the environment's considered, a bit considered toxic. So I had to wear a hazmat suit and a mask, an N95 mask, as I sifted through ash to fi find valuables for those homeowners. And it, it was a sobering experience. And that is unfortunately what some of the evacuees who I've met are going to have to go back to. Um, so yeah, it's a huge operation, lots of pieces and parts. I'm um, privileged and blessed to be a part of it. Uh, though it, it's been hot and so because it's hot and because I have to drive 40 minutes 45 minutes each way I I am weary but I'm fine don't worry it's just the end of the day I have much more energy at the beginning of the day maybe next video will be at the start of my shift and not the end all right then um, if you have any other questions about how it works let me know and I will I'll keep you informed. Bye.